So now we are going to have fun. We did this uh, at the previous conference. We had a blast. And the important thing is we're going to start with some of our own hot takes that we want to kick around, and then you can submit hot takes. So in the app, in the C Event app, the Q&A is open. Just there's a hot take you want us to, to kick around, submit it in, and I'll, I'll bring it up here after we get through ours, OK? Sound like fun? You ready to play? All right, OK, good. Um, so here's the first one. CS just became the new sales organization. And, and um, I, I think I'll start with, uh, with before I go to you, Steve okay. Frost. Stephen, what, what are your thoughts on this? Ish. Ish. Ish, yeah. So when we take a look at the behaviorisms of organizations, 62% uh, of organizations that have customer success have the expansion charter responsibility. We've been tracking that since 2015 when it was 10%. Today it's 62%. 80% are doing the motions of retention. Retention expansion are sales motions, right? Commercial, commercial charters. Um, so customer success is definitely playing, but I don't know that they're the only sales, but they are a new arm to the sales force that works in tandem with the sales force. So ish, now these are fighting words to somebody who's carried a bag. Yeah. So what's your feeling on CS kind of encroaching in on your world here, man. Okay, first of all, by the way, for those of you who don't know, when they say I've carried a bag, that means that someone who, who is actually sold, it doesn't mean you actually have a briefcase. We're, we're talking about that tonight. Oh, oh, okay, okay. Yeah, I'm dating so myself. I don't know that. Yeah. Um, but look, um, the important thing that we see is that CS needs to be an offensive position, okay? Now, that doesn't mean that they're taking down transactions. But if you find that your CSMs are just reactive and taking calls and basically a support organization and not moving the ball forward with the revenue process, that's really what we need them to do. Adoption is proactive. And can you measure if your adoption plays actually lead to greater expansion, lead to greater renewal? Um, the biggest thing, as Thomas said in, in your session today, is we've got to keep sales doing what sales does finding big new opportunities with new customers and with our existing customers. If we can take a lot of the other stuff off their plate, that's wonderful, but, um, but sales is still going to sell. But CS has got to be there to help. Right. And it, it's got, it, one of the challenges we've seen, and we talked about this in my session uh, before this, is this art project versus a science project, right? And the data really shows that customer success can add a lot of value to sales and can bring in a lot of additional revenue, and it is a revenue-generating machine. However, comma, pause for effect. If we're spending so much time doing, as Steve said, yeah. tactical reactionary work, then it's just an art project. Yeah. I think what's interesting about this one is that the, nat the natural posture here for companies is that CS is basically saying, I don't want to be sales. I, you know, I don't like this. I want to be the trusted advisor. Don't mess that up. And sales is saying, hell no, CS is not the next sales you know, engine for us. But the reality is what you just said, this is data-driven science, and we've got to, it's a team sport to grow revenue. So um, I think we have to get mentally, culturally through the knothole on this and embrace the fact that CS can own commercials and the world is not going to fall apart. Um, this one is an interesting one because you and I were just, just had a, a conversation about this earlier. Layoffs are becoming a feature, not a bug. Yeah, uh, layoffs are tough, right? Um, so first thing is we talk about this. I mean, let, let's, let's, let's be real. Like, we're talking about this being a feature, not a bug, but we say that with all empathy. Um, I've been laid off. I've laid people off. It's horrible. And it's really, there's a really human element to this. But we were also talking about it from a practical standpoint in our uh, CRO Council Advisory Board yesterday. And most of the people we talked to said, yes, we're laying people off, but we're also hiring mm -hmm. at the same time through this. And so not just you know, maybe people think it's a performance issue where we've got a chance to, okay, rid ourselves of some low performers, but it's actually a way to shift organizational priorities as well. So people who are really involved with maybe a traditional transactional model uh, and an old way of doing things, yes, that's a layoff, but we're also hiring for new positions, the CS, the, the people who are really helping us make that transformation. So you know, layoffs in many cases, it seems, are yes, they're happening, and yes, they're huge in number, and certainly not all of them are, are, are purposeful. But I think there's a number of them that appear to be really, you know, leveraging that tactic, if you will, to drive transformation. Yeah. No, I, I think I think this is becoming, you know, a, a strategic feature that companies are, are using to, to, you know, reposition their talent, where they're investing, where they're not investing. I think, Stephen, I'd be curious, you know, from, from a CS organization perspective, you know, it's, I think, 
historically more pressure on CS than ever to sort of justify the headcount because of this motion. So do you see a lot of CS organizations sort of reeling from that reality and go, oh, whoa, 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 I've got to really be able to somehow justify the headcount? We absolutely see that. Uh, and that's why we're doing the scaling customer success research journey, because we're trying to really understand how executives are thinking about scaling customer success. But it's interesting. We had our customer success advisory board meeting yesterday, and we have some of those companies that they can't hire fast enough. And they're saying, hey, look, we're hiring yeah. customer success managers, and we need more of them. And some are going, we've got to freeze. We gotta, we've hired too many. We've got to back off. So we see kind of mixed results. And it really depends, again, going back to the charters, what is customer success doing? Um, if you're going to lay off customer success and they have the charter of, of renewal and expansion, well, that's revenue that's going out the door. So that has to be taken in consideration with these yeah. layoffs. Yeah, no kidding. No kidding. The, um, let's go to the next one here. Service revenue, not adoption, is becoming the new corporate currency. And for quite a while, for, for the CS organizations, even professional service, education services, everybody was jumping on this adoption train. You know, I'm here to drive adoption, I'm here to drive adoption. And based on the current economic environment and the pivot we talked about this morning, there's just been this massive pivot that, no, 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 I care. I, I've got to monetize that. I've got to, there's got to be revenue here. And I'm going to start with you, Hal, who is our expert on offers. You know, what kind of heat are you seeing now where people are, are saying, hey, this is something I never tried to structure and monetize and articulate the value proposition. What kind of conversations are you, are you getting into now? Honestly, Thomas, it's gotten very pragmatic, um, especially since the investment dried up. Yeah. Because we can walk in and very confidently say, you have customers using standard services today. You have happy customers using those services. You can put premium services in market. Our benchmark says six to nine months is doable. Net new service offers. And there's probably not a better way to grab that low-hanging revenue fruit that, that we're all looking for. If you're down somewhere in a services service line <laughs> and you want to be a hero, get involved in a premium service launch. You can do it this year, and you will prove that this is something you can do. As you do it, talk to us. And when you do it, let us bring you back to brag about it, and then others can do it. We need to start this snowball rolling. But it starts with one premium service offer. You don't have to boil the ocean. And we just completed our trends with service portfolio study. And we found that if you have more premium customers, you have more support revenue, more professional services revenue, and more technology revenue. If any of those are interesting to you, service revenue just got really important to you. And what about, you know, and I'm hearing this at this conference the past two days, people are realizing, you know, we're in, we're over-serving the customer. We're doing things that we were throwing in and it was okay, but now we're realizing we need to walk some of this back and say, actually, there's a line here. So, so what's the insight if, if that's the conversation they're in? How do they redefine some of those lines? Yeah, I think it's the monetization threshold that you were talking yeah. about earlier. We are giving away things that the customers clearly see are in their interest, and that's the problem. A lot of times I'm asked, should we be charging for these CS motions? And my answer is no, those sound like to me they're driving your expansion, your revenue growth, et cetera. But when I start hearing success managers saying, you know what, there's an assessment we have that lands right on that. There is a move we have that's exactly what you need. That's value add to me. That's management consulting from customer success. So I think it's understanding where the customer themselves benefits. And if you can measure that, that's the adoption that you, you should be To redraw making. that line. I'm going to ask you a question here, Steve, because I literally was just in a meeting and one of the members commented that since it's getting a little bit tough, tougher out there on their product, that the sales folks are you know, much more inclined to throw in you know, premium support or some of the other stuff and just say, hey, we can give the services away for free. Right? Well, I, I, I'm sorry. Did you say that salespeople will sometimes give services away? I know. <laughs> no. This is not crazy here. talk up on the stage here. Sometimes, I mean, here. sometimes I'm disconnected from reality. Can you help me with that? But then do they also heavily discount services? Well, no. I don't know. I, um, that's a rumor. Yeah, that's they, a rumor. So also the, you, you've heard maybe they don't always value services. Yes, well, that's another process. rumor, unsubstantiated, but yes. Boy, um, you guys learned something. You had no idea what was happening. <laughs> yes, I, exactly. <laughs> Thank God you came here. Yeah. No, uh, look, um, when times get tough, Salespeople, yes, we're going to do anything we can. And I, I say this, you know, first of all, don't think sales is not evil, okay? And we talk about sales. Well, I don't want to be in sales. You know what? Whether you do or not, you know, 
there's nobody who cares more about the customer than sales. Because not only is, are there, is their reputation on the line, yes, they got to make money, but it's their reputation, their company's reputation. Most salespeople do what they do um, out of a state of caring about the customer and wanting this to work, not I'm trying to, you know, kill my professional services P&L. So that's, that's the first thing to start with. Um, but remember that salespeople, when times get tight, they're going to sell what they understand. They're going to sell what they know. They're going to sell what's easy, okay? And if you, as service leaders and people who are in charge of the offer, can't make it clear to sales what the value is that they're giving away, and that means they can't position it the right way, yeah, that's going to get lopped off. And so that's part of your homework as service leaders is to make it easy for sales to sell, make the value proposition really clear, uh, bundled around outcomes, and then, you know, get on board. You know, policy is okay. Setting some rules and bounds is also yeah, okay. That's where, I mean, that's where I was going to go with that because I think, uh, so it's getting tough out there, it's competitive, I don't have as many deals, so I'm going to try to sweeten the pot, right? That's going to be a natural inclination. And I think, your point, policy, I think of things like deal desks where you, the deal doesn't go to the customer no. if that stuff's getting thrown in because you all, the company needs that service revenue. <laughs> well, and I'll, I'll give you one. Um, we talked about you know, all the data points we've shown up here. Um, when companies take the time to have a formalized review by services, okay, where, which has some teeth, where services can stop a deal if they don't feel confident that the thing can get implemented, win rates actually go up. Mm -hmm. You know, not a lot, but they go up some. And what's even better about that, we talk about layer, is expansion rates improve. Renewal rates improve. Like, why? Because how will you, you know, drive customer success if you're spending the first nine months arguing about why the thing doesn't work? Yeah. Um, so, you know, you've got to do the right deal up front, and services have got to be able to put that in there. We can't just discount that and give it away. Yeah, I mean, again, you want the good deals, the right deals, with the right customers for sure. Um, so, so this one, this rule of 40 is dead, and I'm, I'm going to put this one on the, on the table because, and again, we talked about this morning what the rule of 40 is, and it is a lens that uh, venture capitalists have been using to say, hey, this is a great company because it's a rule of 40 company. And I can tell you, tracking this data every quarter, there haven't been a lot of rule of 40 companies for quite a while, for quite a while. And, and the rule of 40 companies that you do find are the old traditional tech companies that have started growing again, like you know, something like a Microsoft, and not these SaaS companies, right? So, so if that goes off the table and people start, you know, stop chasing it as a as success, right? Do you guys are you hearing that from your members that hey, we're we're kind of off of that train, or do you think it's still in play? Yeah, I would say from uh, customer success, they're really looking at how much more revenue can they grow for the organization. <clears throat> That's just a, the rule of forty is just a minimum threshold, right? Yeah. <clears throat> the bar has been set much higher, so they're trying to perform to that higher level of function because they have a board to answer to. Mm -hmm. so, so caring more about revenue, anything you're, you're hearing from members on in terms of how they value yeah. success? I should be really honest here. It gives me anxiety just to hear rule of 40 yeah. because most of my career I've inherited rule mm -hmm. of 40 valid business strategies, but then on the services side had to keep that promise. Yeah, yeah. Every rule of 40 company is not built the same. Yeah. And, and there, I don't know, it never felt right to me. So yeah. I'm kind of glad to see the rule of 35 stepping up. It makes <laughs> yeah. a lot more sense to control those sales costs. Yeah, yeah. I think, I, I mean, I, I really, again, what I track, I, I've seen such a significant pivot on the way investors are thinking and talking about this. So I, I think I did a webinar two quarters ago and I, I put the big, you know, RIP, RIP, rule of 40. I think I, I feel. It's, it's going away, but this one is a little more controversial. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Uh-oh. Yeah. So is NPS dead, Stephen Fulkerson? Yeah. Let's start, we'll start hearing the promoters of NPS groaning when I say <laughs> yes. Um, I hear more detractors than I hear of promoters of NPS. When you take a look at our data, we kind of see that NPS peaked at 2021. That's kind of when it was at its, at its you know, greatest arc in, in the category, but right now, when you talk to CS executives, they're like, NPS was great back in 2007 when we were starting this CapEx to OpEx journey, and we were trying to figure out the metric that could give us some kind of value, so, you know, God bless Fred Reichheld for bringing it to us, but now we have adoption frameworks. We have telemetry that gives us greater insights and value, and with that, we can have better predictability, so NPS 
if you talk to a lot of the CS executives, I could point out several here, they may not want to talk, but they're like, I, I just do it because marketing says I have to do it. Sales wants to put it on our website, but it doesn't get me within one to 3% of my ability to predict retention, which is different than renewals. Um, I can retain somebody, but I don't know if they're gonna get there uh, all the way at 100%. So NPS will tell, it's a branding, right? It's giving you brand recognition. But it doesn't tell you, I can give you a 10 and still not renew 100% of my value. I can be a million dollar customer, give you a 10, yeah, yeah, I'm a promoter, but then I'm only gonna renew 500 million, now I gotta lay people off. So that's the disconnect between NPS and it really giving us any kind of value. Well, I mean, you and I have been going back and forth on this one for a while, and I've, I believe in this one as well. I, I think it, NPS is, is not serving us well I anymore, and I'm, I'm sure that's her heresy to many people in the room here, but I'm gonna put a, another nuance on the table that I just took out of a meeting, a uh, healthcare tech board meeting, and this observation was these companies saying, our NPS score is going down mm -hmm. because we do more remote delivery, mm -hmm. but there's, we don't see any correlation with renewals or anything else, and so there's this weirdness right now that because a lot of us obviously have pivoted a lot more to, to remote, is it does seem to impact NPS, but it doesn't matter. So that's something, I haven't even had a chance to talk to Val, but I wanna um, click into that and do a little bit of research to find out companies have moved more to remote. Are they seeing that where NPS goes down, but the customer still renews, they're, you know, they're still buying, et cetera. That really disconnects NPS from something meaningful. So, so we'll see. Do you have any thoughts on NPS? I I really enjoyed Steve's, Stephen's answer, and I feel like I would only make it worse. Okay, all right. I, okay, I would good. listen to yeah, Stephen. That, that was what, you, your, your NPS just went up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's good. 10 out of 10. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. And I heard that sales cannot spell NPS. Is that true? Oh. <laughs> That's not nice. <laughs> I, I, uh, yeah. yeah. Trust me, ladies and gentlemen, this is not all scripted at all. <laughs> the company, I got to zing them. That hurt a little. Yeah. yeah. It, um, it doesn't really matter or CS reports. And I can validate that you hear this in the wild. It's like a, who cares where it really reports. But the two natural food chains here is it goes up ultimately to a service-oriented executive, you know, uh, an SVP of services or a, a chief customer officer type, which is more service-oriented. Or it comes up through the revenue chain into like a CRO or a head of sales. So, um, so I'm gonna start with you on this one. What, yes, Steve, what, what are your thoughts in terms of, of how important this is where it reports? Well, okay, so Steve and I have talked about this a lot, and we've, we've gone into this. So one distinction. So first of all, head of sales is different than CRO in a lot of cases, okay? Yep. So yep. if you've got a true CRO who's, who's overseeing the entire revenue function from pre-sale, you know, past, past customer success and delivery, then that's a little bit different story than a head of sales, a traditional head of sales. But, you know, You've got all the data on this as far as it, it actually does matter quite a bit. Um, but I'll just say from a sales standpoint before he really lands this you know, and brings it home, if you look at layer, all right, once a deal is landed, nothing happens if adoption doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. All right, why would you buy more of something you're not using in the first place? It makes no sense. So that adoption charter has got to be, you know, very much, even as they're handling commercials, it's got to be protected, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, and our, our research is pretty, uh, pretty telling. So if you, for those of you that are members, you know, definitely take a look at Thomas's organizational structure research from 2022, and then look at my customer success research, organizational research from 2022, and then take a look at the paper we just did on the value of the chief customer officer. It's really telling because um, when we take a look at the alignment, I said in my last session, you know, from the line of Dirty Dancing, Patrick Swayze says, don't put baby in the corner. Nobody puts baby in the corner. And that's what's happening in some CS organizations. It's just getting thrown into some organizations, whether it's sales, whether it's um, support. It, it's just getting put someplace because we don't know what to do with it. But it really does matter. Um, when we take a look at our last study, CS was really, it was on the downturn, it was declining in all of the areas except two. It was reporting more into the chief customer officer and it was reporting more into the sales executive. The sales executives were more. So we started looking at, okay, what is the, what's the output of that? So we looked at the DRR. And CS organizations, when they report into all of these executives, think of all the C-suite plus the sales executive, um, when it's, they report into the CEO, they have the highest DRR, 
So not every CS organization reports to a CEO. So who's the next one? Well, the CEO, the chief customer officer, 89%. When you look at the sales executive, when sale, uh, customer success reports into sales, it goes way down to about like you know, 83%. So we're losing DRR. And then when we look at ACV, 4.6% different, or four times, 4.6 times difference in ACV contracts if it reports into a chief customer officer versus a sales executive. So you're losing money hand over fist. And, and the, the, the reason is adoption. The CCOs, the chief customer officers, they're focused on the motions of adoption where others are gonna be focused on expansion and retention. And that's a problem because you can't get to expansion and retention without adoption. And that's what's the key miss with these executives. So if you're not, if your organization isn't thinking about org structure, it doesn't matter, I am promising you, you're losing millions if you're not thinking about that organizational structure. Yeah, and I, to me, the, the definitive thing on this, the org structure survey we've been doing for years, and what we test on that is where do functions report, and then we test you know, are they basically carrying their own water? Are they profitable? Are they, you know, highly unprofitable, just a cost center? And when CS reports up through sales, it's a financial art project. There's just no doubt about it. It's, you don't, it's very rare for it to be profitable. It's typically just, you know, treat the cost of business. And, and that's a tough model in today's world. So I think that it, there's a clear answer on this one. I, to me, there's not it matters. much debate. It, yeah, it, 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 yeah, it yeah, does. It, it, on both sides, we have full agreement on this. Yeah, there's yeah. No, no conflict. And we're not even going to ask you because yeah. we already <laughs> okay, so you're out. You'll just tell us it's a good you're It doesn't really matter yeah. what, what this one. Things. This one I have for you, and I'm going to remind people, if you want to play the game here, get, get the app out. I'm going to start scrolling through for, for recommendations from the audience. Offer management at the service line level is a problem. I can't imagine. Now, so help me out. I'm, a little, I'm, I'm not tracking here because what is wrong with having a salesperson go out and on the fly come up with a new offer that the customer needs? I can't see any downside with that whatsoever. Yeah, me either. Um, <laughs> my benchmark disagrees with me, though. <laughs> not, only, not only would I not want sales minting those at, at, the, at the point of sale, which I think, I think we're going to come to in more, more detail later, but... I said earlier something that could get you in a lot of trouble, and I want to kind of go back a little bit. I said go find those premium services, and I know some of you thought support. I grew up in support. You're right. You can probably do premium support services that you're not doing today, but don't stop there, and that's the contention here. If you just go add another option for one service line, you just added complexity to your portfolio. Sales shouldn't be working so hard to figure out what to sell. You should be more prescriptive toward them. But being prescriptive is hard when you have so many options. So if you're going out and doing a premium support offer, consider adding some premium education services with it. Add some premium adoption services. Consider a good, better, best stack of those for the market you're addressing. Don't stop with a single service line value. The data says converging, convergence is happening. These services are coming together the way we deliver them and the way we market them. So don't stop with support is probably the primary message. If you're in services engineering and professional services, if you're in a formal offer management group and managed services, same thing. Think about cross-service bundles. That's where the good's at. I know I'm, I'm being really preachy here, but offer management at the service level problem is adding choice mm -hmm. and complexity. So, and I, and I apologize, I misspoke on the, uh, or misread the, the challenge here. So, you know, this issue of everybody has their own services that they love across support and CS and everything is becoming more problematic. And, but I think, and we've been advocating for combined solution or service portfolio management for quite a while, right? And it, but do you see companies actually leaning into that more or, or is it still sort of status quo? So some you know, minority people do it, most of them still optimizing mm -hmm. at each line. What do you see? Again, with the anxiety, um, the majority still are not looking at the service portfolio across the board, what we would call service portfolio management. It's stubbornly around 40% in, in okay. the organizational study. Yeah. The trends in service portfolios mm -hmm. just validated that at right around 40%. There's about 30%, a little bit less than that, still doing service offer management in distinct service lines. And the biggest, the third category is other. It's all over the place. Mm -hmm. CX, down service delivery leaders doing yep. the offer. So there's a broad variety of practice now. Yeah. And the advantage is with those that treat all services like a portfolio yeah. and manage it like that, like it's a product management job, yeah. which it is. So 
from the sales perspective, mm -hmm. right? Let's talk about the world where you have all, it's not rationalized, right? You have all these different service groups throwing their offers at sales and saying, oh, here's my great support offers, and here's my great, so like, what is sales supposed to do with that? Well, <laughs> or how, what do they do with that? Then that's why they discount it and give it away, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> look, yeah, seriously. Yeah, no, we're, yeah. we're not, we're not, we're actually not kidding about yeah. this. I mean, I, and I know you, you're, we're being glib, but it's very easy to blame the salesperson for, well, they don't understand the value of my services. Well, okay, do you? Can you articulate to that to them? And are you just leaving it to them to figure out which ones to attach and which ones to give away? If there's not a plan, then they're going to do what they got to do to get the deal. Right. Or at least what they perceive they have to do to get the deal. Yeah. And if they're not factoring in what happens after they do the deal, because we don't have the right offers for education or support, that's you know, problems down the line. And in a recurring revenue world where the vast majority of the cash is going to change hands in year two, year three, year four, mm -hmm. you've got to have that right portfolio on the deal or things really suffer down the line. Yeah. Yeah. So you represent a service line. Why can't you give offer definition to him and make his life easier? What's the problem here? Why, why, are, why are people holding on to it? Um, I think it, it's territorial, right? Yeah. Um, customer success feels like, hey, we're out front, we're talking to the customer, we're engaging with the customer, we know what's best for the customer. Yeah. Uh, but we're not always the experts at developing the offers, right? Yeah. That's where we have to get to, to the offer management team. They test the market, they, they spend the time investing in it, and so there has to be that collaboration, that working together to make it successful. Yeah, we spend so much time worrying about who's selling it mm -hmm. and what we're going to pay them. And we don't spend enough time worrying about what they're selling. Because mm -hmm. what they're selling is way more important than who's selling it or how they're selling it. If you don't get the what they're selling right, no. it's not going to work. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I think the reality is, and in, in, I don't want anybody who's an offer you know, designed to take umbrage with this, but, but it, t it typically is a weaker muscle, to your point, in most tech companies. It's a weaker muscle. And that's problematic in itself. And then again, when you just throwing a bunch of stuff out and creating all this complexity for both sales and your customer, it's insult to injury. So I think it is a, absolutely a winning move to build a really strong muscle there that has best practices, really knows how to create a compelling portfolio, the value proposition, and it's rationalized across service lines. I'm really learning a lot from these two. Yeah, 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 yeah I know. It's, <laughs> wow. So what I, what I said I think is, is, is spot on, but I know that there's, in the audience here, there, there's going to be a lot of, I am not ready to do that. But just onboard that, think about it. Um, next one. If your CRO can't spell data, they are not a CRO. Oh, you have a CRO council. So well, we, we did, can they spell we, data? We're spending a lot of time today worrying about what salespeople can spell. So, uh, <laughs> we are. Most of us went to college. There's um, a reason for that, Steve. But anyway. Yeah, no, look, guys. Go. Um, data is going to be so incredibly important to efficient revenue growth. Um, and, and where we see, when we think sales data, it's okay, what's in our CRM? And I've got forecasting, what do you mean I can invest more in data? Uh, no, it, it's really starting to think about all of the silos and pulling not just the revenue functions together, but all of their data together to get a full picture. And I'll give you a couple things to think about just from a data perspective to help your CRO. Because you're right, if, it's, if they're not forward thinking and you've got a sales leader who's not really pushing the envelope on, on what they can do with data and analytics, then, then you need to help them, okay? Because they need to do it. So first of all, when you look at the layer model, we've talked about a player. And you know, again, analyze, place, and then layer. Leveraging data to help you in the sales process. Start back to front on that. Get really good at your renewal metrics your propensity to renew models, your red flags, your, your consumption models. Because if you know what a good customer looks like, you know they're a good customer because they're renewing, okay, that informs the rest of the model that can go all the way back to the land part of it. And the second thing I'll tell you, since we have a lot of service executives here, you have a lot of data that your CRO and your salespeople need. Okay, they need to understand the problems the customer is having. They need access to support logs so they can see who's having trouble. Uh, they need access to understand you know, what sort of, uh, of statements of work are going well, what isn't going well. Um, and if you have that data but you're hoarding it, it makes it very, very difficult for your sales organization to become data-driven like they need to be. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I, again, another conversation that I've had in the last 24 hours about these data silos. Yeah. And that, you know, to have the holistic view of the customer and all this kind of good stuff, we, we've, 
we've got to be giving that you know to to a central perspective so we can really make hay with it. And 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 again, that's a thing that culturally often we you know that's my data, yeah. my, either Honestly, my sales data, the, my CS the, data, my whatever data. If I was giving advice to somebody who, and I actually did not too long ago, gives advice to someone who said they were looking at becoming and taking on the CRO role, yeah, I told them you get like James Bond level access to everybody's data silos. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because if you don't do that, you can't see the big picture. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I've interviewed a lot of CROs on Tectonic, and boy, you, you, you know when you have what I, the enlightened CRO. They are thinking very differently than a traditional sales executive. They are very data driven and they are thinking about all their channels. Mm -hmm. It's In like this conversation of, yeah. hey, should renewals be over here, you know, whatever. They are, that's how they see the world. They don't see the world through this blunt instrument of, okay, I have a sales channel and yeah. maybe a channel channel, right? And that's it. So, all right, we, we are getting some great questions in here. And so I'm gonna just start, I'm gonna start accessing these. And the, this one here, I think sort of builds off what you started to put on the table, and it is that customer success owns churn. Does customer success own churn? Well, if they have the uh, ownership of renewals, uh, yes, they have, uh, they have that responsibility. If it's owned by sales and success as a partner in it, then it's a partner-owned endeavor. But at the end of the day, if they own uh, the customer engagement process, then they own the customer experience. Then they own the adoption. And I'm going to completely disagree with you. Adoption is a part. I'm going to completely disagree with you. All right. So what if it is a I'm super, back my chair up. super, <laughs> it's, a, it, it's a super shitty product? Does customer success own churn? Well, um, I know what they're thinking. Yeah. <laughs> if it's if it's super, bleep, bleep, yeah. Um, it's more of a, we've got work to do, but they should own the engagement and be working with product management to help communicate from the customer that closed loop feedback to get you know, product management to go, how can we fix this to make it better so that the customer has. So there is a part that they play in, in that churn ownership. Well, that's, that's what I'm chipping at because, uh, that's what I put on the table, I'd respond to this, is that if the product has got all kind of problems, mm -hmm. issues, if the offer is poorly defined. There's not enough real value there. If sales sold the wrong customer, right, mm -hmm. right then it's unfair to say that CS owns churn, I, I think. You know, so I think it's those that will go back to that's what I'm building off what you're saying. It's going back and doing the, the forensics to say, why did that customer churn? Oh, value proposition, wrong customer profile. You know, oh, by the way, quality issues. They couldn't, that's the mentality we have to have because I think if, if it's one throat to choke on churn, that's going to be a losing model. So I think that was a great question. Thanks to whoever submitted that. Um, and I got to go with the ones that are getting voted up here. Okay. Top of the list right now, ladies and gentlemen. Customers won't pay for the support they've historically gotten for free. You're on. Correct. <laughs> Correct. That's okay, why, can I, next one. <laughs> that's, why, that's why you don't give support for free. But let's assume that you're in the majority and you've already done it. Net new customers don't know that. And everyone you have is part of your migration plan, right? And you have the strategy for your migration, and you can identify those populations that are resistant because they've gotten it for free. Maybe you need a special play just for those customers to turn them. We're going to, for the next three months, continue this premium level of coverage, and then you're going to have to buy into it. That might be a strategy for someone you're willing to lose. Maybe others, you just grandfather them in. The point is, you've, most of you already made this mistake. Don't let it stop you from fixing it. Put the premium to market, focus on net new, build a proper migration plan, and bring them along. I've seen it over and over and over again. It's not even that hard. It requires persistence and cross-functional collaboration. But what's amazing is, and actually it's a little befuddling to me, we've already learned this lesson in the industry. This is what's so amazing. I, even in, in the executive advisory board that we had yesterday, there was this debate, and it goes something like this. Some of this support stuff, you, you know, you gotta do support for free because the customer says, well, you, are you telling me your, you know, your product is so crappy that now I have to pay for support, right? Why, why are you charging me for this? Why don't you make your product better, right? Well, that's a trope that goes back 30 years, and for people who are too young to remember, PCs used to come with a free three-year warranty. <laughs> do people remember that? And until they didn't. Why? Because we can't afford to do that. And we had to walk that back. And if you want that premium support, 
you're going to pay for it, and there's value in it, and you get this response, and you get these projects. So we've had to do this before, and so anybody who has a SaaS offer where a bunch of stuff's bundled in there, you're saying, oh my gosh, they're conditioned, we could never walk it back. I will not onboard that argument. I'm sorry. And, you, and I think, importantly, what you said, there's a methodology to do this. We've done it before. We've done it decades ago. We're doing it right now. You just, it's hard. But again, I, I keep questioning, what's going to be harder, fixing these foundational problems or dealing with a crappy business model. Yeah. I mean, that's the issue. Yeah, but that was I'll a great add one. Just yeah. one last thing on that. Like, there is a long storied history of companies not giving away for free anymore stuff that they used to give away for free. And there's an old saying, like, it's only a big deal if you make it a big deal. Mm -hmm. Like, this happens all the time. And don't let your salespeople, oh, you gave it away for free last year. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. But there's value here, so we charge for it. Your job, just make sure you've articulated the value <clears throat> so that they can communicate it to the customer. Yeah, don't discount value. You no. know, that which is given away, you know, that which is given away for free is perceived to have little to no value. So if you're giving it away for free, it's already perceived to have no value. Yes. I, I had this thought this morning when I was eating breakfast, I don't even know why, but I, this voice of this old MBA professor I had came into my brain and he said, you know, the, the easiest way to make a business model more profitable is through price. It's through price. I mean, you, suddenly I have more money. Same offer, same cost to deliver. If we take the price from zero to something, <laughs> we've just moved the dial, right? It is the easiest way to do it, what actually. Can, what can also happen there, too, is it's organic to the culture of the company. I won't say which company I was with, but if you saw my LinkedIn profile, you'll know who I was with. But one of them I walked into, it was discount haven everywhere. Yeah. They discounted everything. And I walked in the door and I said, why are we discounting? And they said, because that's how we get the deals done. Yeah. And I, I said, well, why are we giving away value for free? You don't discount value. You sell value. You yeah. don't discount value. And it took, it took time to change the mentality of everybody in the organization to stop discounting value. Yeah, I think and every time I, I, I hear that position, which is correct, I think the tough thing is the reality is Defining the value and articulating it is hard, not easy. Yes. It's hard, not easy. And that's why we default to let's just give it away. It's a hell of a lot easier to just give it away and not do the hard work of pointing to the business value. But that's what we have to do. And again, I, we are at this inflection point where we have to get way better at that. Here's a, here's a really good one. I love this one. Customers don't buy into digitized support. They still want more human touch than anything. I disagree. Um, the reason I disagree is um, I don't have my iPhone on me, but if I were to hold it up, my daughter's generation has always had an iPhone in the internet. And they get what they need by you know, using technology. Yeah. Um, so I think that, that's a, that statement is a reflection on my generation, our generation, because we've always had human interaction and we're used to dealing with humans. But today's generation that we're preparing to take the roles that we have they're used to just dealing with technology. So some of them are very comfortable with just going, hey, if I can get what I need through digital engagement, I don't need a human, uh, a human engagement. Then you have another person, personality, that is the hybrid. They want a little bit of digital, and they want a little bit of human, and I'll let you know when I want the human. Uh, but to default and think that everybody wants a human engagement, it's the wrong, it's the wrong thing. Yeah, I, yeah, I'm gonna jump all over this one because um, for a couple different reasons, and I talked about this morning, I mean, this this digital customer success motion for large customers mm -hmm. is a real thing. And it's a real thing for what you just said, is that's actually some ways that, pe or that a lot of people prefer digital interactions. There's also a concept out there, it's not mine, it's Christopher um, Lockheed's, Lockheed's uh, around digital natives versus analog natives. And digital natives prefer digital first, full stop. And I'm an analog native, right? but we're aging out of the workforce. And eventually it is gonna be dominated with people that are digital natives. And they are not gonna to wanna to call, I mean, I look at my son, and I look at my daughter, and when I tell them, oh, you should just call the company for that? Do you guys do that with your kids? You see how they react? I mean, they're just like, oh, call, I gotta, why, why, can't, why can't I do this? Why can't I go to the website? They are digital natives. So that, Generation is coming, folks. So I, I mean, I just I don't buy into the you know that's still what customers want. I think a lot of us in services, that's what we hope. We wish that that's really going to always be the preferred model. I, I, I don't think so. 
So this one is now top of the list. CSAT isn't accurately exposing how our clients really feel. You want to take a crack at that? We already, we already eviscerated NPS. Want to go after CSAT? <laughs> well, C, C, CSAT's actually on the rise. It's growing faster um, and customer effort scores compared to NPS. So uh, it is growing. I, I think that the question sets are probably not um, created correct, correctly. One of the things that's very real is survey fatigue. And a lot of organizations, especially that we interact with in our advisory blocks, because we have a voice of the customer or metrics advisory block, when we have them send over our, their questions, you know, sometimes we'll get 20 and 30 questions. Well, you know, there's a problem there. I'm like, when did, they, when did survey fatigue kick in? Well, they'll stop around 10 or 12. Well, the reality is six or eight. Mm -hmm. You got about six or eight really good questions, and they don't get prioritized at the most critical parts, like what's the number one question out of the six that you want to ask? So if they drop off, that they're gonna, you're going to get what you need. And that's a problem in the creation. So when CSAT's getting created, there's a lot of variables that aren't considered. And as a result, they're not seeing the results they'd like to see. Yeah, I mean, I'll take a crack at this. And I'm not a CSAT fan. You know, I'm not. And the reason I'm not is two reasons. Number one, it's a, it's a proxy metric. It's a proxy. I mean, what, what, what really matters? Did the customer renew? <laughs> Are they spending more money with it? That's the primary metric. This is a proxy metric, right? And when you have organizations that are running around and they're like, that's the primary metric, that's all I hang my hat on is CSAT, then I think you have your eye off the ball around the real business. I deeply believe that. That's number one. Number two is it's morphed, again, it's morphed into this, it is the end all be all what we chase. And I think, do I think customer feedback is helpful? Absolutely well-structured surveys to say, how, how are we doing? Absolutely, but use it in context, mm -hmm. right? But I, I never forget, I was talking to an executive who was, had the same worldview I do on CSAT, and they said, look, he goes, this is how CSAT works in, in, our, in every company I've ever worked in. CSAT's going up, high fives, we are awesome, show that to the CEO, awesome. CSAT's going down. It's going, why is it going? I don't know why the F is going down, right? It's going down. What are we going to do? Well, don't show that to the CEO, right? And so that's not helpful. It's poorly structured surveys. And again, just hanging your head on that, I, I think your, your eyes off the bigger ball. And so. those, those CSAT really should just be a validation of the telemetry you're already collecting. So it's if you're a collect signal. It's a signal, which is it's good. It's a signal. And it's just valid. It should, if you're using it, it just should reinforce is the data I'm collecting that I've identified from my telemetry, is it telling me the whole story? And a CSAT or an NPS is something that could supplement that. Yeah. All right, here's this next one. I'll take this one. Traditional CFOs within the organization and customer organization are not ready for as a service. You think? <laughs> Do you, you think? <laughs> yes, they are not ready. They are not ready for this. I mean, I can tell you um, definitively. And the challenge there uh, consistently is that we have a generation of technology leaders that grew up in the traditional models and they know them really well. They know products, and, you know, the CFOs know the financials of that model, the CEO understands it, sales knows how to sell it. I mean, we are completely optimized for that world and then as a service shows up and they're like, that is a completely different business model that, you know, and they, they are not ready for it. Um, I, again, I, the case I'm making here at this conference is the current environment is going to force people to start you know, leaning in and learning more. And when I talk to executive teams, one of the things I tell them, if they're a traditional company, is everyone at this table, CFO, CEO, et cetera, needs to get an MBA and as a service. You need to start really understanding you know, ARR and renewal and all this stuff. It's a completely different language. And depending on where they are in their career, sometimes they don't really want to do that. I'll be, I'll be honest with you, right? So some of it, we've got to wait for a certain generation to age, to age out. The other thing, and I was just in this conversation literally an hour ago, traditional hardware companies out there, right, um, is you start to think or start to get into more as a service, specifically managed services, those margin profiles are different, right? And a CFO will look at that and say, well, I, I don't want that business, Full stop. I don't want that business. Well, well, but if that's where the market's going, and that's where the revenue growth is, and that's what customers are asking for, they want it in a managed offer, you don't get to make that choice. And we still have a lot of executive teams that are doubling down on their traditional business models 
as if the market gives a shit. They don't. They don't. So, you know, this is a big knot hole. I, I totally agree with this, you know, observation. It's very, very real. It's still going to take a little while to work out. But, you know, again, I have a deep belief that, that economics forces everything. That's what forces business. That's what forces the frog to jump. <laughs> you know, is economics, and we're you know they're getting tighter and tighter. Thomas, could I jump in on that? Yeah, one? absolutely. To me, the question that jumped into my mind when I heard that question is, well, yeah, obviously a lot are, a lot of senior leaders are not ready for this. But what should that mean for the offering leader? And I, I want to point back to Thomas's keynote earlier. He showed several times an image that showed a before and after financial situation. And he explained taking some of that services cost and taking it below the line and moving some, some sales cost into different groups. Go back and learn what Thomas was saying if you didn't pick that up. Learn how to read the 10Ks. Learn how to argue why your margin is not gonna be diluted by this thing that you're doing and why. You need the basic MBA talk track to talk to the C-level. If you wanna be a successful offering manager, you cannot bypass that capability. If you need help with that, there are so many resources available. LinkedIn Learning, just to start. There's so many programs. We do MBA in a day types of advisory work where we spend like 30 minutes on calculating ARR and we need every minute of it. So there, the information is there, grab it. Raise your strategic level as an offering manager, start talking to the C-level and watch the value get unlocked. They, you can build credibility there, but you have to talk that economic Yeah, language. you're making a fantastic point, which is you know, the CFO or the executive team isn't speaking this yet, they don't have their MBA in as a service. You get your MBA in as a service, yes. so that you can have that intelligent conversation. I think that's super. These questions are so good. I want, I want to do all of them, and I'm running out of time here. I want to get at least to two more. Okay. First one: Is it essential to incentivize sales for them to sell services? So I'm going to turn to the most coin-operated <laughs> function in the, in the in the company here. He's is it essential all, huh? to incentivize sales okay, buddy. if they actually want them to sell services? Seen it done both ways. You know, I, I, I just look. I, I made my I made my last um, group when I was in my breakout session. Say it with me, but I won't make you guys. Like the comp plan is not transformational, okay? And and everybody seems to think that you can solve every problem ever known to mankind in their 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 business as a service technology cars. I don't care if we just change the comp plan. Well, then they'll sell services, okay? But l let's let's talk about why we don't sell services for a minute. All right, um, do we understand the value, and is your value clearly articulated? Well, I don't know. Okay, well, then they're going to give it away, right? It doesn't matter whether you incentivize it. You can, you can put that, that bogey hard. on them. Too confusing, if it's yeah. too hard, too confusing. You know, I hear, uh, well, sales complains that we slow down their deals. Okay, well, do you? Do you slow them down? Because they can't wait, man. The average tenure of a VP of sales in an as-a-service company is 19 months. It's like a World War I artillery officer, okay? Like... <laughs> They, are, they, they can't slow down, man. They can't wait. I love it. So, like, you know, I, I say, do they need to be incentivized? I don't know. Give them good services. I hear my, my sales team knows how to sell products, not services. Well, okay, make your services look more like products. All right? So this isn't just on them, and you will not solve all problems with the comp plan. Yeah, I, I completely onboard that, and I, here's what I think the trifecta is, and this is a great question, right, because you're not going to solve everything through the comp plan, but it's a component. I think the trifecta is you have well-defined offers, right? You have good policy, like we were talking about, hey, why did this deal go through and you didn't attach the services? There's got to be a check there. And sales does have incentive. There should be some incentive there. Like, I'm not saying there shouldn't be, obviously, yeah. right? But, but the comp plan reinforces the right behaviors, but ultimately, you know, you have to help them justify the value, and you have to be part of their journey and not just say, go sell services, and, and it, 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 it's, it, it's a team effort here, seriously. Yeah, no, but your, your point that the comp plan does not solve everything, it's important, but it doesn't solve everything, I think is spot on. I wish I could get to these other ones, but my clock is ticking here. Um, this is a killer conversation. I'm going to do one update here. Uh, for those of you that aren't aware, we just launched this thing called Research Journeys. I mentioned the survey I'm doing on the financial model of SaaS. It's part of that. Go check this out. We have one on... Monetizing? So uh, scaling customer success is live through May 19th. So please um, get with your 
MSM, get the link through May 19th. That's going to wrap up that one. And then in June, we start monetizing customer success, okay, three-part yeah. series. Yeah, yeah. So, so we have, I think, four different uh, um, tracks going on. One of them is profitable uh, as a service in SaaS. It's just a way for you to participate as we continue to mature our insights on this. So it's, it's designed so we can all learn from each other. So, uh, gentlemen, that is our session. Thank you so much for participating. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of the conference. I'm sure we'll see you. Thank you.